This is the 23rd video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're going to talk about what it means for a set to be countable and uncountable. Let's jump right into a definition. So we say a set A is countable if it's either finite or it's equinumerous with the natural numbers. That is, it has the same cardinality of the natural numbers. And if you recall from last time, that was equivalent to having a bijection between the natural numbers and that set. Okay, and then we say that A is uncountable otherwise. In other words, there is no bijection between N, the natural numbers, and the set A, or their cardinality is not the same. Now, the cardinality of the natural numbers is an important cardinal number, if you will, and so we generally give it a name, and that name is Aleph Zero. So I think my like handwriting for this is not great, but it generally looks like this shape. You can Google it and get an idea for different ways of write, writing this down. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so like I said, the cardinality of the natural numbers is Aleph zero, but we could write that as an equation as follows. Okay, so let's move on to our first big result of the day, which will help us prove a lot of associated results. And that is a set is countable if and only if its elements can be arranged into a list. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement, which means we have two directions to prove. Let's prove the forward direction first. So we'll start by supposing that A is countable. But notice that breaks into two cases immediately. So either A is finite, so let's write that as case one, A is finite, but in that case we can write A as its elements. So in other words, we have A is A1, A2, A3, all the way up to AN, where N is the cardinality of A in this case. But clearly that's a list. So we've listed the elements of A. So if A is finite, this is pretty straightforward. And so let's look at case two, which is A is infinite and Thus, the natural numbers have equal cardinality to A, and let's say that's via a bijection, which I'll call F, which goes from N to A. But notice that this bijection can easily be used to build a list of the elements of A. So notice we have a list with every element from a, and that list goes like this, F evaluated at one, F evaluated at two, F evaluated at three, F evaluated at four, and so on and so forth. Okay, so either way we have it, via these two conditions that give us countability, either finiteness or infinitely countable, we can build a list that contains all of the elements from A. So that finishes the proof of this forward direction. And now we'll move on to the proof of the reverse direction. So let's suppose the elements of A are arranged in a list. And that list is A1, A2, all the way up to AN, and then let's keep going. So maybe I won't look at the case when this list is finite. If this list is finite, then A is clearly a finite set. But then if A is a finite set, then it's countable. So let's only look at the case where A is infinite and all of its elements are on this list. But the fact that we've got a list of all of these elements gives us a really easy way of creating a bijection between the natural numbers and the elements on our list. And the natural numbers is just defined by the order of our list. So we could send the natural number one to A1, we could send the natural number two to A2, and in general, we could send the natural number N to AN. So in other words, this defines a bijection, which we'll call F, going from N to A by F evaluated at N is A sub N. 
but the fact that we've got a bijection from n to a is exactly what we need to have the cardinality of n equal to the cardinality of a, finishing the proof of this result. Okay, so now let's apply this result a few times. Our first main result will be to prove that the rational numbers are countable. That is, the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same as the cardinality of the rational numbers, which may seem a little bit surprising because the rational numbers seem so much bigger than the natural numbers. In fact, it seems like they should be closer to the real numbers, but they're not. They're not closer to the real numbers. In fact, they are equinumerous with the naturals, and we'll prove that here. Okay, so our strategy will be to list or create a list which contains all of the rational numbers. And then since we have that list, that list can be used to find a bijection which will finish it off via the result of the previous theorem. So I've started a chart here that will help us form our list. And along this first row, we'll write what will eventually become the numerator of a certain rational number. And then along the column, we'll write what, what will become, what will eventually become the denominator of a certain rational number. Then in the numerator, we're going to list all integers. So I'll list 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, so on and so forth. So I think we can all agree that that will be a list of all of the integers, kind of as we saw previously. And then down the column, I'll list all of the natural numbers. And that's because if I take the numerators to be any integer, I only need the natural numbers as denominators in order to get all of the rational numbers. Okay, so here we'll have one, two, three, four, and then so on and so forth. I think that's far enough to get an idea of what's going on. And then at the intersection of the rows and the columns, we'll form a fraction with the denominator given by whichever column we're in, or the numerator given by whichever column we're in, and the denominator given by whichever row we're in. So let's see. This will be 0 over 1, here we'll have 0 over 2, 0 over 3, 0 over 4, and so on and so forth down. So notice those are all equal to 0, which is not super interesting, but we will definitely have repeats here, which we'll take care of in the end. And then here we'll have 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, so on and so forth. So those are all new. And then next we'll have negative 1 over 1, negative 1 over 2, negative 3rd, negative 4th, so on and so forth. Here we have 2 over 1, 2 over 2, 2 over 3, 2 over 4, so on and so forth. Negative 2 over 1, negative 2 over 2, negative 2 over 3, negative 2 over 4, and then continuing in that direction to the right and down. Notice that we've listed some of the numbers more than once. We have one half here and we have two over four here, which is equal to one half. We have one here and then we have two over two, which is also one here. So once we make our list, we'll have to like exclude repeats. Now, how will we make our list? Well, the trick is to count along a diagonal. We can't count along all of the rows because we've got an infinite list here, an infinite list here. There's nowhere to stop going out that way. But if we count along diagonals like this, we can make a list. So let's do that. So we'll count like this first, okay? And then after that, we'll count like this. So maybe I'll put a circle around what we keep and then I'll go straight through what we don't keep. So we will not keep this 0 over 2 because we've already counted it. Then we won't keep this 0 over 3 because we've already counted it, but we will keep the 1 over 2 and the negative 1 over 1. So just to like be clear, this is the order that we're making our list in. So this is, will be the first element, the second element, the third, the fourth element, and then the fifth, sixth, and so on will come from here, here, and then trending down and right. So let's draw what's going on in this next diagonal. So we'll get a third, we'll get negative half, we'll get two over one. So we'll get all of those numbers. So this will be the fifth element of the list, the sixth and the seventh. 
And then let's keep going. So we'll skip the zero over five, which is right here. We'll get the one over four. We'll get the negative one over three. We will skip the two over two, but we will take the negative two over one. And that'll be the eighth, ninth, and 10th elements of our list. So now putting this all together, we'll see that we will form a list. And that list goes like this, zero, then the next element is one, and then one half, and then negative one, and then one third, and then negative half, and then two, and then a quarter after that, and then negative one third after that, and then negative two after that, and so on and so forth. So we've made a list that definitely contains rational numbers. Will it contain all rational numbers? Well, it will because somewhere on this table is every rational number. And since we're counting through every element of this table and either keeping it or throwing it away, we'll eventually count every rational number. And that's the, essentially the idea of this proof that the rational numbers are countable. We do that by making a list. Notice that it would be extremely difficult to write down a formula that defines a bijection between n and q. In fact, it's not really worth it given that this description here without a formula is pretty clearly a bijective correspondence. And it's kind of nicer anyway. Okay, so let's do another related result. Now we're gonna prove a related result. And that says if A and B are both countable, then so are the sets A cross B, their Cartesian product, and A union B, their union. Okay, so let's get off the ground. So the first thing that we'll do is write A and B as lists. So we'll write A as A1, A2, A3, dot, dot, dot. So there we have a potentially infinite list there. And then we have B is the set B1, B2, B3, dot, dot, dot. So we know that we can write A and B as lists by that theorem that we started the video off with. Now that we've done that, we wanna focus on the case when we're looking at A cross B, and then we'll swing around to A union B afterwards. And the case when we're looking at A cross B is very, very similar to what we did with the rational numbers. You can maybe even guess what it's gonna look like by what we did with the rational numbers. So let's list everything in A along this first row and everything in B along this first column and then we'll make diagonals just like we did before. So here's A1, A2, A3, A4, so on and so forth going infinitely in that direction. And here we'll have B1, B2, B3, B4, and then infinitely down as well. And then at the intersection of the rows and the columns, we'll put our ordered pairs. So here we have A1, B1. Here we have A2, B1, A3, B1. Finally, A4, B1, and so on and so forth. That's what's happening in the first row. And then in the first column going down, we'll have A1, B2. Then A1, B3. A1, B4, and then down with entries A1. Then we can fill out the rest similarly. So here we'll have A2, B2, and then A3, B2. And here we'll have A2, B3, and then A3, B3. And then I'll let you fill in more if you need to. And now we're gonna play this same game that we did with the rational numbers to create a list. So let's go across the diagonal here to make our first entry in our list. So there's our first entry. And then we'll go across this next diagonal here to create our second and third entries in the list. And then we'll go across this diagonal here, which is right below it, to make our fourth, fifth, and sixth entries in the list. And then we'll just keep going down and down and down and down. And since every element of A cross B is in this array somewhere, and we're going through every element of A cross B and like listing them in this certain order, that means we have actually formed a list of all of the elements of A cross B. 
but forming a list of the elements of A cross B means that A cross B is countable. In other words, the cardinality of A cross B is the same thing as the cardinality of the natural numbers. Okay, so now let's look at the case when we're taking A union B. So the case for A union B is a little bit shorter. We'll just make a single list. We don't have to make an array or anything. It's just what we'll think about is shuffling the elements of A and the elements of B together. So I'll write A union B with the following notation. So we'll take A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and so on and so forth. So we alternate elements of A and elements of B. And then, well, since the union throws out duplicates, we'll just throw out duplicates whenever we need to. But the end result is that we've created a list of all of the elements of A union B, but that's exactly what was needed to show that the cardinality of A union B is the same thing as the cardinality of the natural numbers. We found a list of the elements of A union B. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce a couple of more definitions having to do with unequal cardinalities. Now we somehow wanna classify sets that do not have equal cardinality by size, and we'll do that with the following definition. So let's suppose that A and B are sets, then we define the following three notions, one of which we've defined before. So the cardinality of A equals B, if and only if there's a bijection from A to B. Let's recall we also had this notation here with a equal sign and a subscript C. I'll remind you of that notation as well for these other two definitions. So we say the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injective map from A to B. And we have similar notation for that as well. And then we say the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injection from A to B, but no bijection from A to B. And again, we've got like that similar notation for that notion as well. Okay, so now we're gonna prove a really important theorem, and it's like a real classic one as well. And it says that if you have any set a, then the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of A. So in other words, this action of taking a power set always builds something which has a larger size. And let's see the motivation for this. Let's say that if A is finite, we know the following fact. The cardinality of the power set of or the cardinality of A is most definitely less than 2 to the power cardinality of A. That's because like x is always less than 2 to the power x. But that's equal to the cardinality of the power set of A in this finite case. So there we've like made the inequality. But of course, the finite case is not every case. We definitely have infinite sets, and that's what we want to prove here. A general proof that will include infinite sets. So the first thing that we'll do is construct an injection from A to power set of A, but then show that there is no bijection. So let's first consider the map, which I'll call G, going from A to power set of A. And what it does is it takes an element A and it sends it to the singleton A, so the singleton subset A. Okay, well, let's notice that this map is injective. So I won't check that, that's pretty clear that this map is injective. But the fact that this map is injective tells us that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of the power set of A. We just have to show that there's no bijection to finish this thing off. So now let's show that there is no bijection and we'll do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that F going from A to the power set of A is a bijection. But since it's a bijection, that means it is surjective. So that's important. The real thing here is that it will fail surjectivity. Now we'd like to consider a very carefully constructed set. So let's consider this set, which I'll call B, 
and it's made up of all elements from A, so it's a subset of A, and those elements of A satisfy the following rule. A is not an element of F of A. So this may seem kind of crazy, but notice that what does F do? It takes elements of A and sends them to elements of the power set. But what's the what are elements of the power set? Well, they're subsets. So what F really does is it takes elements of A and it assigns them to subsets of A. But that means we can talk about an element of A being inside of its assigned subset or not. And this is how we'll define B. So it will be all A in A such that little a is an element of F of little a. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's note that this is most definitely a subset of A, which is the same thing as saying that B is an element of the power set of A. But now, since F is surjective, we can find a little b in A such that b equals F of little b. So it's a subset, which means it's in the power set, but this is an onto function, so we just find the pre-image of this subset. But now the real question is, is little b in b? And this is where we're, gonna, where we're gonna run into a really interesting contradiction. So let's do this by cases. So case number one, which is B is an element from B. If B is an element from B, by the definition of this capital B, that tells us that little b is not in F of little b. Oh, but that's a problem because F of little b equals capital B. So we have if B is in capital B, then B is not in capital B. But that's impossible. That's a contradiction. We have something happening and it's negation happening at the same time. Okay, so now let's look at case number two, which is B is not in B. Oh, but this capital B equals F of little b. So we really have b is not an element of f of little b. But that's exactly the condition to land in b. So that implies that little b is in the subset of b. But that's another contradiction. We said that b was not in capital B, and that implied that b was in capital B. So something is true and its negation is true at the same time, which is another contradiction. But those are the only two cases. Both lead to contradictions. So that means up here in our assumptions, we made an assumption that is false. And what is that assumption? Well, the assumption is the existence of this bijection from A to the power set of A. So that means no such bijection exists, but since no such bijection exists, we have satisfied the condition down here for the cardinality of A being strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of A. Okay, so I want to do two things before we leave. One is look at a result that's built off of this, and then also give you some warm-up exercises. So it follows from that last theorem that we proved that we have an infinite list of non-equal infinities. So we could start with the natural numbers, which is a countably infinite set, and then we could take the power set of natural numbers and create a set with cardinality, which is strictly bigger than the natural numbers. Then we could take the power set of that and create another set which is bigger than the cardinality of what we had in the previous step. Then we could continue taking the power set forever and ever and ever and create all of these infinite sets with unequal cardinalities, kind of increasing cardinalities if you will. Now you might say, well, I know that the natural numbers lives right here. Well, is there anything maybe more common that has the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers? And yes, in fact, the real numbers has the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. Then what about the power set of the power set of the natural numbers? Well, yeah, all functions from R to R, not continuous functions, but all functions from R to R has the cardinality of the power set of the power set of the natural numbers. Then you can keep going and these things get kind of more obscure. 
Maybe another question which is obvious to ask is, okay, I have an infinite set here, natural numbers. I have an in infinite set here, which is either real numbers or power set of natural numbers. They are unequal. One is larger than the other. Is there any set in between them? In other words, can I find an inf infinite set whose cardinality is larger than natural numbers but smaller than real numbers? Well, that's actually unknown, and that's in fact known as the continuum hypothesis. And also, in fact, it's been proven that it's impossible to prove it true or false. And versions of set theory are consistent with it and without it. So I think that's pretty interesting in itself. Okay, so now that we've said all of this, I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So now I've got three nice warm-up problems based on what we saw today. The first is to consider the following set, which I'll call A. It will be all ordered pairs m comma n, where m and n are natural numbers, and m is less than or equal to n. So let's show that's a countable set. Next, let's describe a partition of the integers into five countably infinite subsets. So you'll have to recall what a partition of a set is, but that might be a nice review. And then finally, let's prove that the set of all complex numbers is in fact uncountable. And that's a good place to stop.